We all tend to use that cheesy line that photographs are worth a thousand words, right? Or at least we used to say that until Twitter came along and told everyone, hold on a second, a thousand words, huh? That's kind of a lot. How about 22 characters? And then a few months later, with their most recent update, they informed the world that photos weren't even worth those 22 characters in a tweet. They were worth nothing. So what is the value of photographs? In an age in which billions of images are uploaded every single day on social media platforms, the number is so big that our brains simply can't grasp it. A while ago, an artist tried to visualize this massive number, so he printed out every single photograph uploaded on Flickr in just 24 hours, just one single day, and this was the result. He filled up an entire room with an avalanche of photographs, and if you look close enough, you realize that each single shot is not that compelling, but it's the moment to take a step back that you realize that what really makes you stop and think is your collective mass. We are extremely visual beings, to the point that more than half of our brain's computational power is dedicated to sight. We are designed to rely heavily on our eyes because they are the door through which we make sense of the world, and we are convinced that seeing is believing. We are obsessed with images, because through them, we understand things around us. We share them, we connect with our lives. To make sure that your friend from high school you haven't spoken to in years sees the avocado toast you're having for brunch, right? Hashtag blessed. We document our day-to-day -to, -day to make sure that we have photos of it, because if there are no photos of it, it never happened. Because photos don't lie, or do they? Now, images can be extremely important and powerful. Some of them can inspire us, some can scare us, some can even convince an entire nation that certain decisions, like for example, the war, are something that maybe should be reconsidered. Like this very iconic photo, we've all seen it, a girl covered in napalm running on the street, and you almost feel like you're right there in front of those kids running towards you, in the middle of that war. And that feeling, that feeling of being right there, is exactly what makes this photo so brutally powerful. And it wouldn't be as strong of an image if there were other elements that distracted you, like, let's say, a photographer was filming his camera on the side of the road. Now, this one right here is the original, uncropped frame the photographer sent the bureau right after the event. But the day after, a lot of magazines and newspapers decided to run with the cropped version. So yes, seeing is believing, but this shows us how we tend to pay attention to certain images more than others. And because of this, <coughs> nowadays, some photographers and some editors use tools like Photoshop in ways that could be deemed a little bit problematic. And we've seen a lot of that, especially you know, in the beauty industry, with photo manipulation, all the way up to certain cases in news photography. But that's, that kind of blatant lie is very easy to spot and categorize as a fake. And we're not here for the easy stuff. So today I want to challenge you, and I want to take you to a place where the lines between what's real and what's fake become really blurry. And because of that, some dangerous things might happen. A while ago, I found myself stepping in that very place. After three years living in Jerusalem, which is in one of the regions with the most complex social and geopolitical intricacies in the world, I started working as a photographer. And the camera became a tool, and sometimes an excuse, to look at these complexities from up close. So I got to march with hundreds of thousands of ultra-Orthodox Jews on the streets of that ancient city, the same conservative city, where at night I would go to a bar with dim lights to follow the life and document to follow the life of a drag queen. But you know, it's the Middle East, and the only thing people care for when they hear about it is conflict. So I decided I had to take photos of this conflict. There was only one little problem with that. I wasn't quite sure where to find it. So I made a few phone calls, and I got in touch with a group of photographers who were going to a neighborhood in East Jerusalem where every weekend, on the same day, at the same time, a riot would happen. And there it was. That's me on my very first day on the field, all happy and goofy-looking, on the one on the left. Now, I showed up there with no protective gear whatsoever, which I strongly advise against if you're planning to cover a riot, for obvious reasons. But luckily, someone let me borrow their spare gas mask and helmet and what looks like a pair of scuba diving goggles, probably a prank on the first timer. But anyway, I went there week after week, getting great photos of 
uh, protesters throwing rocks and soldiers shooting tear gas and stun grenades. But I was living basically the thrills of the action of being a photojournalist on the field, and I loved it. But at the same time, in the back of my head, there was a feeling of something being a little off, and I just couldn't quite put my finger on it, so I just kept shooting. Now, sometimes these riots were pretty dangerous, and this is where I found myself one day. <laughs> Now, that guy, hyperventilating inside the gas mask, that's me again. And as you can tell, I'm completely freaking out. Half of me is terrified because two stun grenades are just blown up right next to my face, which is not the best way to start your weekend. And the other half is panicking because I knew that at some point I was going to have to explain to my mom what I was doing on that day. But that kind of situation allowed you to get the type of photos that you can easily publish. But that feeling of something being wrong just wouldn't leave me alone. And this is when I started realizing what the issue was. While sometimes these riots were dangerous and high stakes, other times, this is what I witnessed. crossing a boundary, or was I crossing a boundary? I was creating a portfolio of what, in my head, conflict looked like, because I had seen other photographers' work. I had seen what photos won the big awards every year, and I wanted to win those awards. I was taking photos that represented what I thought the audience wanted conflict to look like, because I, too, had seen Hollywood movies. I basically learned what photos I had to take in order to get published. Like, this photo, for example. There was a boy in the middle of the road with this challenging stance, his face covered, rock in his hand, there's fire and smoke in the background, there's action, tension, drama. But what happens if you look at the same situation from a different angle? <laughs> this is when I started realizing that what I was really interested in here wasn't the writer or the soldier, but a third element that was central to the dynamics at play an element that we often tend to ignore, and a lot of times, we even actively try to get rid of from the narrative, the photographer. So, I started playing with the construction and the deconstruction of drama by adding the photographer to the frame, to show that we're not the fly on the wall that some claim to be, because there's no such thing as an invisible, objective observer that has no influence on the scene. And again, with this photo of Israeli forces using their shields, you're catapulted right in front of the action, you can almost touch them. But the whole scene radically changes if you turn your camera just a little bit. <laughs> now, covering these rights didn't just mean looking at the scene from far away. We were right there, often carrying a lot of gear, both to take photos and videos, and to protect ourselves. And when you factor all that in, nothing really looks the same. As you can probably tell, not everyone was thrilled about these photos being taken, including the photographer in the frame was a taboo, and I was playing with one of the sacred pillars of journalism, the expectation of objectivity. 
With these photos, I was challenging the idea that journalists are just witnesses that have no influence on the scene they document. Now, some photographers would passionately claim that they had no effect on their subjects. They were like, they would ask me, "What do you mean we alter the scenes? We don't tell people what to do or how to pose." But at the same time, some of us would ask another important and kind of controversial question: Would the violence have happened if the photographers were in there? Now, this is not a kind of question that we can answer with a simple yes or no, because we can just A/B test the same scenario with and without media presence. What we could do, though, is look at physics, where we have something called the observer effect, according to which the simple act of observation will influence the outcome of the phenomenon you're observing. But does anyone know how to read a formula here? No, I don't either. To be honest, I don't even know if that's the right formula. It just looks really plastic, so I threw it out there. So. <laughs> Let's get rid of that and think about this. How many of you here have a smartphone? Right. So each single one of you has already experienced the observer effect, and you can prove it every single time you take out that smartphone and point its camera towards someone. Now that person is probably going to smile or pose, or they're going to act like they're casually ignoring you while they're actually stressed out about whether or not you're shooting them from the more charming angle. But they're eventually going to do something. Now take all that and apply it to a situation in which ten photographers are approaching you, and they're fully geared up from head to toe with helmets, gas masks, two big bulky cameras each hanging from their shoulders, and they're coming there to take photos of what you are doing. They're waiting for you to do something. When I was shooting these riots, we were right there in the middle of the action, trying not to get each other in the frame, and I totally ruined the guy's photo. We were side by side with the subjects that we were documenting. And there was interaction. This was made very clear to me. One of the very first few times that I was up there in the field, and I still had no idea what was going on. But in the middle of the riot, the guy stopped whatever he was doing, and with a rock still in his hand, he starts approaching me, and he gets closer and closer. And then meanwhile, I'm just there, terrified, trying to figure out ways to get out of the situation. And I can feel my heart beating fast, and sweat drops falling down my back. And he keeps getting closer and closer, and gets a few inches away from my face, and he goes. Can I get a business card? <laughs> Now I later learned that he asked me that to make sure that it was an actual photographer and not an undercover agent. But this showed me how everyone there was very well aware of our presence and would not be shy of interacting at all. Photographers are actors; they have agency, just as much as the subjects that they document. Behind those cameras and behind the keyboards that type the articles that we all read, there are people, human beings. With ideas, with opinions, and this is not to criticize the specific journalist for having a position. This is to make sure that the audience is aware of the fact that the simple act of choosing to cover one story or to take one photo also means choosing not to cover or take another. The act of choosing is itself subjective, and the problem here is not with the lack of objectivity from the side of the journalist, but with the illusion of objectivity. From the side of the audience. So let's try to get back to our original question: Do photos lie? Or, in other words, is this less real because of this? Now we talked a lot about lies, truth, fake, real. So in order to answer that question, we should probably look at what reality actually means. And if you think about it, it's not that simple to come up with a definition of reality. So I just did it the old-fashioned way and looked it up in a dictionary. And this is what I found: reality is the state or quality of having existence or substance. Now, that situation right there had just as much existence or substance as this one. They're both two things that I've seen through my lens and decided to shoot. They're two of the many ways in which you can interpret an event. One is not more or less real than the other. And this is why it is important to question what you see and what you read, because sometimes it's not as simple as just a distinction between real and fake. The term "fake news" nowadays is something that we're all very familiar with, because it's been at the center of media coverage since the latest U.S. elections. Now, alternative facts, like someone called them, have always been there, but suddenly we all started caring about them. Because they were used as a political weapon, and there was a problem with that. So, what do we all do? 88% of millennials get their news from Facebook, 
So we blame the spread of fake news on Facebook. Now, social media platforms never claim to be a place where objective journalism will be defended. They're not the kind of media outlet you can expect to fact-check all information that gets published. They're just media aggregators. They're places where content lives. That's it. But they are the way in which a lot of people these days get their news. And we became lazy. We started accusing a platform instead of realizing that it's on us to not be passively ingesting all these images, videos, words. Now more than ever, we do have the tools to not just be passively ingesting all this information without challenging it. So don't just look at things, question them. Because questioning is the most important step to take in order to really understand what's being presented to you and transform from a passive observer to an active user. Thank you.